The canonical commutation relation between the position operator and momentum operator is one of the most fundamental equations of quantum mechanics. It's what implies that you can't precisely measure the position of a particle and its speed at the same time. But where does it really come from? In this video, I want to explain the quantum origins of this equation based on symmetry principles. Now, the world of quantum mechanics is very different from the classical mechanics that we're all much more accustomed to. And we can't derive quantum mechanics from classical laws like F equals ma. Quite the opposite. It's quantum mechanics that's the more fundamental theory, and classical mechanics emerges from it. But there are close parallels between many of the equations of quantum and classical mechanics, as I've told you about in the last couple of mini lessons here on the channel. For example, we've seen that the quantum commutator of operators plays a similar role as a classical operation called the Poisson bracket, up to a factor of ih bar. In particular, the Poisson bracket of the position x and momentum p in classical mechanics is x bracket p equals 1. And if we apply the rule to turn this Poisson bracket into a commutator bracket divided by ih bar, we indeed get the canonical commutation relation. I'll link the video about that up in the corner if you haven't seen it yet. And make sure you're subscribed to the channel so you don't miss future videos about related topics. But in this video, I want to do better than just replacing curly brackets with square brackets and declaring voila. I want to show you how the canonical commutation relation emerges from the symmetry principle we discussed last time, that momentum is the generator of spatial translations. I'll put that video up in the corner too. What we showed is that in classical mechanics, the momentum defines a transformation that picks up our system and slides it over in space. And if this spatial translation is a symmetry, then the momentum is a conserved quantity. I'm going to explain the quantum version of that same statement in this video and show you how it essentially defines what we mean by momentum in quantum mechanics, and leads inexorably to the canonical commutation relation. To do that, I'm going to have to start with a whirlwind tour of the basics of quantum mechanics that we'll need. If you haven't seen much of it before, things are going to look a little strange, but I still think you'll get a lot out of the video, so stick with me. As usual, you can get the notes at the link in the description to take your time exploring all the details, and as time goes on, I'll be making more videos that flesh out all of these ideas. So here's our three-minute crash course. In quantum mechanics, the state of a system, like a particle or atom or whatever else, is described by the state vector. I'm using the Greek letter psi here, and the bar in angled bracket is the notation we usually use for vectors in quantum mechanics. It's called a ket. It's a generalization of an ordinary column vector. The state vector psi contains all of the information we can get about our particle. The things we measure, like its position or momentum, say, correspond to operators that act on the state, x hat for the position operator and p hat for the momentum operator, or I'll use a hat symbol to indicate the operator corresponding to a given quantity. Whereas the state psi was analogous to a column vector, an operator is analogous to a matrix. It acts on a state and gives you a new state, similar to how a matrix can multiply a column vector and give you another vector. You can also act multiple operators on a state, like x and p. But in general, they don't commute if we switch the order, meaning that xp and px do different things. Their failure to commute is quantified by their commutator, defined by xp minus px, and denoted with these square brackets. The goal of this video is to show you how symmetry dictates that this particular commutator is just a number, ih bar. Another operation on regular old vectors that you're probably familiar with is the dot product, also called the inner product. It takes two vectors and returns a number. It essentially tells us how much the vectors overlap with each other, at least when one of them is a unit vector. The notation that we use for the analogous operation for two quantum states, phi and psi say, is written like this. And again, you can think of it as the overlap between the two states. Remember that we call the state psi a ket. The flipped object phi is called a bra, so that when you put them together, as in the inner product, you get a bra ket, or bracket. Yes, that's a hundred-year-old physics pun from Paul Dirac, who introduced the notation. Say we want to find out where the particle is. In general, even if we're told the state of the particle, we can't say for sure where it is until we make a measurement. In fact, the weirdness of quantum mechanics is that the particle typically didn't even have a well-defined position before you measured it. All the state psi can tell us is the probability of finding the particle at position x, say. What we can do is define another state vector, ket x, which describes a particle that is precisely at position x then the probability of finding our particle with its state psi at that location is given by taking the bra ket overlap between the two, and finally squaring it. This is the probability of finding the particle at position x. 
The overlap between psi and x is called the wave function of the state, psi of x. So we can alternatively express the probability as the magnitude of the wave function squared. Wherever this function is biggest, the more likely you are to find the particle there when you make a measurement. For example, the particle might be in a state where it'll be found at point A with probability one-third, or at point B with probability two-thirds. We don't know which value we'll get until we make the measurement. And before we do measure, the particle isn't really localized at one or the other. If we set up a bunch of identical copies of the system side by side, each in this particular state psi, and then measure the position of the particle in each, a third of the time you'll find it at A, and two thirds of the time you'll find it at B. That's profoundly bizarre. However, my aim for this video isn't to dive into the rabbit hole of what it means to make a measurement in quantum mechanics, but just to tell you this basic fact. When you make a measurement corresponding to an operator like x hat, all you can report beforehand if you know the state psi are the probabilities of getting various values of the position. Therefore, you can't in general say where the particle will be, but only the average value of where it might be. This average is called the expectation value of the operator, x hat in this case. And it's given by sandwiching the operator between the bra and ket for the given state. This is just an instruction to act x hat on the state psi, which gives you some other vector, and then to take the inner product of that vector with psi. Okay, those were the essential elements of quantum mechanics that we need to accomplish the aim of this video, which again is to explain what it means that momentum is the generator of spatial translation symmetry in quantum mechanics, and then to show how that implies the canonical commutation relation. That's what we'll do in the rest of the video. First of all, what does it mean to have a symmetry in quantum mechanics? Like any other transformation, a symmetry will be represented by an operator, u hat say, that acts on the space of quantum states. If this transformation is to be a symmetry, it had better not change any of our probabilities. So how can we arrange that? Well, u likewise transforms our definite position state, and when we flip that around to see what happens to the corresponding bra, it becomes bra x u dagger, where the dagger stands for what's called the adjoint. Again, that's something you might have encountered before in studying matrices, where to find the adjoint, you simply take the transpose of the matrix and then complex conjugate it. The simplest way to ensure this transformation leaves the probability function unchanged is to require that it preserves the overlap of psi and x. The bra picks up a u dagger on the left, and the ket picks up a u on the right. If this is to be invariant, then the operator should satisfy u dagger u equals 1. In other words, the adjoint of u should be the same as its inverse, so that when you apply them in sequence, you undo the transformation and get 1. Operators that satisfy this special property are called unitary. We therefore learn that if our symmetry transformation is implemented by a unitary operator, it will preserve the probability function for the position x, as well as the probability functions for any other variables, just like we wanted. Most symmetry transformations in quantum mechanics are therefore represented by unitary operators. Now let's focus on spatial translation symmetry. Classically, we learned in the last video that momentum is the generator of spatial translations meaning that P defines a transformation that shifts the position x of the particle over. In quantum mechanics, we're therefore looking for a symmetry operator u hat, whose effect is to shift the position operator x hat over by lambda. To understand how this works, consider how a general transformation changes the expectation value of x hat. When we sandwich x hat between the bra and ket for psi, and then transform it, we're going to get a u on the right and a u inverse on the left. Notice that as far as the expectation value is concerned, we can implement the transformation just as well by instead replacing the operator x hat by u inverse x u. Therefore, the translation symmetry that we're looking for is defined by setting u inverse x u equal to x plus lambda. Now, how does the momentum operator factor into all this? u of lambda defines a translation by lambda for any value of this parameter. In particular, we can take lambda to be really tiny, so that we're talking about an infinitesimal shift. When lambda equals zero, we haven't done anything at all, of course, and so u should just be equal to one. Then, when we turn on a small value for lambda, we'll get some small transformation that's only slightly shifted away from the identity operator. And we can write it like this for some other operator g hat. As lambda gets even bigger, there'll be lambda squared and lambda q terms and so on that also become important. But let's focus on the infinitesimal case. Actually, as a matter of convention, it's convenient to pull out a factor of minus i over h bar here, which just amounts to rescaling our definition of this operator g. The h bar ensures that g has the units that we want, and the i ensures that g itself is real in an appropriate sense. 
G is called the quantum generator of the symmetry transformation U. Based on our classical experience, with momentum being the generator of translations, let's now define the quantum momentum operator P to be the generator of this transformation. The inverse transformation on the left just flips the sign, 1 plus i over h bar lambda p. And so, our definition of an infinitesimal spatial translation looks like this. Let's multiply out the left-hand side. First, we've got 1 times x times 1, that gives us x. Then, we've got 1 times x times minus i over h bar lambda p, and that gives us minus i over h bar lambda xp. Then we've got the lambda p term times x times 1, that gives us a plus i over h bar lambda px. And remember, the order matters here, so px isn't the same thing as xp. Finally, there's also this last combination, but that goes like lambda squared. And remember, we're working with the infinitesimal transformation here, so we'll discard that. Now, let's pull out this common factor of minus i over h bar times lambda. Remember that we defined this difference, xp minus px, as the commutator of x and p. So here's what we get by expanding our infinitesimal symmetry transformation. x hat minus i over h bar lambda times the commutator of x and p equals x hat plus lambda. Now we'll just cancel out the x's on both sides, divide out the common factor of lambda, and multiply the i h bar to the other side. Then we finally arrive at x bracket p equals i h bar. The canonical commutation relation. At last then, by defining the momentum operator as the generator of translations, we're led directly to this fundamental equation of quantum mechanics. I'll finish up by pointing out that all this machinery is very general. For example, time translation symmetry, which we saw is classically generated by the Hamiltonian, is quantum mechanically described by the unitary transformation u equals 1 minus i over h bar t times h, where t is an infinitesimal time interval and h is the generator, the Hamiltonian operator. Under this transformation, an operator like p transforms into u inverse p u, which, for small t, you can expand just like we did a moment ago to get p minus i over h bar t times p bracket h. Thus, if the quantum momentum is to be constant in time, it must commute with the Hamiltonian operator. And this is the quantum statement of translation invariance. I threw a ton at you in this video, and you can go through the details more carefully if you pull up the notes from the link in the description. If you're new to quantum mechanics, then all this information and notation was probably a little overwhelming, but it'll all make more and more sense the more you learn. I'll be posting more videos diving deeper into what all the ingredients we talked about here mean, so make sure you're subscribed to the channel to not miss out. Please give the like button some love, leave any questions in the comments, and I'll see you next time with another physics lesson.